Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Miss Haywood Helps. Today we're going to be going over everything you need to know about classification. So let's start out by going over our standard and essential questions. Our standard is 5L1, which is obtain, evaluate, and communicate information to group organisms using scientific procedures. Part A says develop a model that illustrates how animals are sorted into groups, vertebrate and invertebrate, and how vertebrates are sorted, sorted into groups, fish, amphibian, reptile, bird, and mammal, using data from multiple sources. B says develop a model that illustrates how plants are sorted into groups, seed producers, non-seed producers, using data from multiple sources. Our essential questions for this unit are going to be, how can I classify animals? What makes a certain group of animals distinct? And what characteristics do scientists use to classify all types of plants? We are going to address all of these questions and all parts of the standard. So get comfortable, get out your notebook and get ready to take lots of notes. So you may be asking, why classify? If that's a question that you have, I want you to think of three examples where we group things. If I look around my house, I could group things by color, I could group people by age, and I could group the rooms by the activities that we complete in them, sleeping, family time, and getting ready for school. Why do we group these things? For me, I group things to keep them in order. When classifying living things, we put them into two large groups animals and plants. Classification of animals. Scientists have divided the animal kingdom into two groups, vertebrates, which are animals with a backbone, and invertebrates, which are animals without a backbone. When we think of grouping animals, we want to group them by their characteristics. Animals, including humans, can be grouped by a variety of characteristics. Today, we're going to talk about some of those physical characteristics that help describe animals. The types of characteristics that we use to characterize animals are body coverings, skin, fur, scales, or feathers, body shape, tall, short, long, or broad, body color, brown, black, green, red, or whatever color, number of appendages, tail, arm, legs, fins, or wings. We also group animals by methods of movement, walking, flying, swimming, or slithering, types of mouth, beak, flat teeth, sharp incisors, fangs, features on feet, hooves, toes, and claws, and their gender, whether they are male or female. Let's begin by talking about vertebrates. Vertebrates are animals with backbones and they can be divided into five groups, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. Let's begin with mammals. Mammals give birth to live young. They feed their baby with their own milk. They're more or less covered with fur and are warm blooded. Some examples are lions, cows, whales, pandas, and yes, humans. Next, we have birds. Birds have feathers, they lay hard-shelled eggs, and they are warm-blooded. Some examples include hawks and eagles, parrots, sparrows, and peacocks. Let's talk about reptiles. They are cold-blooded, they lay leathery-shelled eggs, and they have dry skin covered with scales. Some examples are snakes, turtles, alligators, and chameleons. Now we have amphibians. Amphibians are cold-blooded. They lay eggs, they have smooth, moist skin, and are able to live on land as well as in water. An example of an amphibian is a frog. Now we're on to fish. Fish are cold-blooded, lay eggs, but some do give birth to live young, have moist skin covered in scales, and breathe through gills. Some examples of fish are clownfish, goldfish, and sharks. As you may have heard me mention, animals can be grouped based on their blood. They can be grouped based on whether they are warm-blooded or cold-blooded, but what exactly does that mean? Mammals and birds are warm-blooded, which means they can make their own body heat even when it is cold outside. 
Whether it is sunny or hot outside or there is a snowstorm and it is very cold, warm-blooded animals have body temperatures that usually stay the same. Remember, warm-blooded animals have body temperatures that stay the same whether it is warm or cold outside. Cold-blooded animals like reptiles, amphibians, and fish become hotter and colder depending on the weather outside. For example, when the sun sets at night, their bodies are cooler because there is, it is less warm outside. When the sun is out, however, their bodies soak up the heat and they become warmer. Remember, cold-blooded animals' body temperatures depends on whether it is cold or hot outside. Let's run down a summary of vertebrae. The first group we have are mammals. They have hair, they give birth to live young, they feed their live young with their own milk, and they're warm-blooded. Birds have hollow bones, have feathers, and are warm-blooded. Reptiles lay eggs, breathe air, they have dry scaly skin, and they are cold-blooded. Fish have, are bony, they have scales, they breathe through gills, and they are cold-blooded. And amphibians live part of their life on water and part of their life on land. They have gills as babies and lungs as adults, and they are cold-blooded. All right, guys, we're moving on to invertebrates. These are animals without a backbone, and there are eight groups of invertebrates. They include mollusks, flatworms, annelids, roundworms, sponges, echinoderms, and cnidarians. First, we have mollusks. Mollusks crawl on a fleshy pad, and they can have a shell. Some examples include slugs and snails. Flatworms have flat, worm-like bodies, and an example of a flatworm would be a tapeworm. Now we have annelids. Annelids have round, worm-like bodies. Their bodies are divided into segments. One common annelid is the earthworm. On to roundworms. Roundworms have long, thin, round, worm-like bodies and have bodies with no segments. Now we can move on to sponges. Did you know SpongeBob was not just a made-up character, but there were animals that he was fashioned after? That's right. Sponges have bodies made, made up of loosely joined cells. SpongeBob's partner in crime, Patrick, is not just a made-up character either. He's fashioned after a sea star. Echinoderms have bodies that are divided into five parts, and they have a spiny outer covering. Cnidarians have thin sac-like bodies and they have tentacles. A common example of a cnidarian is a jellyfish. Our next group of invertebrates are arthropods. Arthropods have lots of legs and segmented bodies and there are four groups of them. Arachnids, centipedes and millipedes, crustaceans, and insects. How many of you like spiders? Spiders are arachnids. They have four pairs of legs and have bodies divided into two sections. Centipedes and millipedes. No, these arthropods do not have hundreds and millions of legs, but they sure look like they do. They do have long, thin bodies and pairs of legs on each of their many body sections. Crustaceans. Crustaceans have five to seven pairs of legs, and their first pair is often used as pinchers. Their bodies are also covered in a shell. Some examples would be lobsters, crabs, and scorpions. The last group of arthropods are insects. They have three pairs of legs, their bodies are divided into three sections, and they often have wings. Some common examples are the butterfly, the grasshopper, and the mantis. So let's go over a quick summary of invertebrate. Remember, these animals have no backbone. There are annelid worms, arthropods, cnidaria, echinoderms, mollusks, and sponges. Are you guys still taking notes? I hope so because we're on to plant classification. Plants can be divided into two groups, non-flowering plants and flowering plants. Non-flowering plants can be divided into two groups as well, spore-bearing and naked seeds. The spore-bearing plants are mosses and ferns. The naked seed plants are called gymnosperms. 
Flowering plants can be divided into two groups as well, monocots and dicots. Monocots and dicots have a lot of differences. Monocots have a single embryonic seed, narrow long leaves, parallel veins, vascular bundles which are scattered, and flower parts in multiples of three. Dicots have two embryonic seeds. They have broad leaves, a network of veins, a ring of vascular bundles, and flower parts in multiples of five or four. Some more about monocots. Monocots are any flowering plant having a single embryonic seed leaf, leave with parallel veins, and flower with parts in threes. These include grasses, lilies, and palm trees. What about dicots? Dicots are any member of the flowering plant or angiosperms that has a pair of leaves in the embryo of the seed. There are about 175,000 known species of dicots. The most common are garden plants, shrubs, and trees. Let's talk about the parts of a flowering plant. Flowering plants have leaves, flowers, stems, and roots, and they all have different functions. The main functions of a leaf are photosynthesis and gas exchange. A leaf is often flat, so it absorbs the most light, and thin, so that the sunlight can get into the chloroplasts of the cells. Most leaves have stomata, which, it, which open and close. They regulate carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water vapor exchange with the atmosphere. Flowers, sometimes known as blossoms or blooms, are the reproductive structure found in flowering plants. The stem has primary functions of supporting the leaves, to conduct water and minerals to the leaves, where they can be converted into usable products by photosynthesis, and to transport these products from the leaves to the other parts of the plant, including the roots. The roots, four main functions are absorption of water and inorganic nutrients, anchoring the plant body to the ground, and supporting it, storage of food and nutrients, and translocating water and minerals to the stem. The life cycle of a flowering plant. Flowering plants have a specific life cycle. They start off as seeds, like, and those are like baby plants. They have a hard outer shell that protects the seed embryo inside. Then they go to germination. The seed ends up on the ground. It needs air, water, and soil to grow. When a seed begins to grow, this is called germination. The first growth will usually be some small roots, then stems will grow. Sprout or seedling. When the first sign of life appears above the soil, this is called a sprout or seedling. Next, we move on to a mature plant. The seedling will continue to grow into a full mature plant with leaves, roots, and stems. Finally, we have flowering. The mature plant will grow flowers. Through pollination, the flowers will produce seeds. When the seeds end up on the ground, the cycle will begin again. What are some parts of plants that we can eat? We can eat seeds, leaves, roots, and stems. Okay, that's enough about flowering plants. Let's talk about non-flowering plants. Some plants reproduce with seeds, while other non-flowering plants reproduce with spores. Let's look at the difference between seeds and spores. What are seeds? A seed is the start of a new plant. Seeds can be different shapes, sizes, and colors. What are the parts of a seed? Seeds are protected by a seed coat. Seeds contain tiny leaves and a root. Seeds contain stored food for the new plant. What are some plants that produce seeds? Some examples would include corn, pine trees, and sunflowers. Well, what are spores? Ferns do not have seeds. Instead, they reproduce with spores. A spore is a tiny part of a fern that can grow into a new plant. Spores do not have a food supply for the young plant like seeds do. The fern has big leaves divided into smaller parts. They have dots on them. The dots on the underside of the leaves are cases where spores grow. Spore cases have spores inside of them. Another type of plant that has spores is moss. Mosses grow where it is shady and damp. The spores of mosses 
form on tiny stalks that grow out of the green part of the plant. To review, what are some plants that produce spores? Moss and ferns. That was a lot, so let's review. Remember, plants can be divided into two groups, non-flowering plants and flowering plants. Non-flowering plants can be divided into two groups as well, spore-bearing and naked seeds. Flowering plants can be divided into two groups, monocots and dicots. In this video, we discussed animal classification and plant classification. Let's go over the essential questions. The first says, how can I classify animals? Well, you guys now know you can classify animals by vertebrae, whether they have a backbone, or invertebrae, whether they don't have a backbone. You also can classify animals by how they walk, how they're covered, how they feed your, their young, and even by the type of blood that they have. The second essential question says, what makes certain groups of animals distinct? So we know that that means whether they have a backbone or not, and their physical characteristics, their wings, their fins, the way they breathe, if they lay eggs, or how they feed their young. Our last essential question is, what characteristics do scientists use to classify all types of plants? That's an easy one. They classify plants by the way that they reproduce, whether it is by flowering or non-flowering. I hope this video helped. I can't wait to see you in the next episode of Miss Haywood Helps. See you guys later.